All right, if you got your Bible, if you don't, there's probably one next to you on a chair. You can always take them. They look something kind of like this. This is a Bible. It's made out of paper. Uh, Flip on open to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 is where we're hanging out. If you're wondering, it's the same place we were last week. We're doing a couple weeks in Genesis chapter 2 in our series called Earthly Intentions. Genesis chapter 2, second page of your Bible. Really easy to find. We're doing a series called Earthly Intentions, and we are talking about the intention, God's intentions in creation. God's rationale, the reason God did the things that he did. Why did God make the world the way he did? Why did he say the things that he said? Last week we were talking about adventure. We were talking about this idea that you were created for more than just mediocrity. You were created for excellence. You were created for adventure. You were created to go forth and into the wild to accomplish something with your life. Now this wasn't some sort of dressed up prosperity gospel. This wasn't some sort of dressed up life's going to be okay. But rather it was a mandate on the way God intended you to be when he created you to say you were created for a purpose. Can we get an amen for that? If you guys talk back to me, it helps things go better. It helps me know when we're on track. So you guys can always just go, yeah, or amen. Just pretend you're in Alabama, and it'll be great. All right, Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to do some reading this evening. Genesis chapter 2. We're going to actually pick up just a couple verses later after where we were last week. So we're going to start in verse 18. Are you there? Say, I'm there. Beauty. All right. All right, the Lord God said, then the Lord God said, it is not good. And you have to understand the context here. Everything else up to this point, God has said, it is good. It is good. It is good. And then he arrives and he says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord, God for, the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the, mo the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, all the wild animals. But still, there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took one, out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And after the best verse, now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Awesome. For those of you that are married, what, what? I'm not sure if my wife's blushing or not. So, <laughs> yep. Uh, you know, the opening verse that I started on, it is not good for the man to be alone. The magnitude of that statement cannot be overstated. I can't put enough emphasis on how significant it is that it, it says here that it was not good. This, uh, this narrative here that's happening in Genesis chapter 2 is, is very poetic in nature. There's a repetition to it. And importantly, when you have repetition, when something changes, when something goes from being good, 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 not good, that means, hey, pay attention here. Something significant is being said here. And the significant thing being said here is that you, that humanity, that the God people created were created for relationship. We were created for community. It is not good for the man to be alone. It is not good for the man to be alone. It is not good to be alone. Translation, you were created for community. You were created for relationships. You know, in this context, we have this, this sinless, this beautiful, this wonderful, this perfect creation. 
A creation where humanity and God are walking in relationship with each other, where creation is wonderful, where it's unfolding. That Adam's in given purpose and he has these jobs to do, but it says that it is not good. Because even in the context of this perfect creation, the man was alone. He was outside of relationship with other people. Now, when you understand that God was not like making some mistake here, it wasn't like God was like, oops, how did that happen? I didn't mean to make a man and not a woman. That's because how God speaks, in case you're wondering. I looked it up on YouTube. It's not like God was surprised here, but it's drawing attention to the fact that God created us for relationship. He created us for friendship. He created us for community. And it's not like this is some sort of optional bolt-on. It's not like we can walk through our lives and be like, you know what, I'm just doing so good. I'm just tracking. I'm just doing my thing. I'm just cruising along. And you know what, I'm just going to bolt on some friendships now. I got money, I got success, I got my job, I got uh, a sweet car, I got everything going for me, and I'm just going to bolt on a couple relationships. Right? That's ridiculous. We all know that we were created for relationships. And when there is relational absence or relational strife or fracture in our lives, there is nothing that quite compares to the strife and the pain that that causes us. Causes us. It says here, in verse 23, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from the man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. They shall become one flesh. What's the, what does that mean? What does it mean to become one flesh? In other words, it's saying, in the context of relationship, in the context of community, something fundamental about the way, the way God made us is satisfied. Something fundamental about the, our created nature is satisfied when we live in relationship and in community with other people. My question tonight, or actually my sermon tonight, is on help on service. But why have I opened it up talking about relationships? Why am I talking about community? If I was to pull the room, or if I was even just to even ask myself and say, hey, Robin, how are your how are all your relationships going? We discover that in in many of our relationships there's strife, there's loneliness. Just one sec. Thanks. I've got a little backtrack going on in my back corner, and it's like throwing my brain for a loop. Actually, I think it's the backtrack on the band. Can anyone else hear that? Yeah, okay, so it's not just me. Hey, there we go. Yeah, can we give it up for the sound team? Woo! All right, I'm not crazy. Where was I? Right. So for many of us, our relationships are complicated. For many of us, our relationships have this, this element of like, you know what, I'm created for relationship, but I'm lonely. I'm created for relationship, but my relationships are not that great. I'm created for relationship, but I feel isolated. Especially this time of year when it's a time of year of change, when everything's moving very quickly, it's easy to feel isolated, it's easy to feel like we don't belong, like we don't matter. And then on one hand it's saying, well this is great Robin, that I'm created for a relationship, but I feel like my relationships are inconsequential. I feel my, like my relationships don't matter, I feel like they're not that significant. And then on the flip side, last week we were talking about adventure. We're talking about this created purpose that we're all made for. And yet I know for, and yet I know for many of you, you're walking in, these in this purpose going, I don't really feel it. I don't really feel like I'm created for adventure, like I'm created for purpose. I'm just walking through step by step by step, confused. And you put these two together and we walk through these lives where our relationships are confused. The people we're walking with and journeying through life with are confused and we're not sure why. We're not sure how to make it better. And on the other hand, we're confused with why the things we apply ourselves to are confused. Why we feel unsatisfied and unfulfilled in the work that we apply ourselves to. So my first point tonight is that while, yeah, we were created for relationship, and yeah, we were created for purpose, 
We were ultimately created to serve something bigger than ourselves. We were created to serve something other than ourselves. We were designed, get this, we were designed to co-work, to work and partner with and journey with a creator God according to a greater purpose. Check it out. In, in answer to the man's loneliness, what does Adam start doing? In answer to his loneliness, what does God have him do? So the Lord God, in verse 19, so the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one of them, and he gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But there was still no helper just right for him. Now, if we could just put aside for a second that there was no helper just right for him. God's response to man's loneliness was to say, you were created to do something in partnership with me. You were designed to journey with me, the creator God, and accomplish something bigger and greater than you would by yourself. He created us to find joy and satisfaction, first and foremost, in partnering with and co-working with our creator. Adam was assigned work to do by God. And it's not that God needs us to do anything for him. God didn't need Adam to go and do any work. He didn't need him to till the land and plant seeds. He didn't need him to name the animals. God doesn't need us, but he chooses to involve us. He chooses to partner with us. He chooses to include us. Nine years ago, to run back in time, I was a student here at McMaster. I was uh, studying engineering, and I was looking for a church. And I'd kind of been to the churches in the area, and I was like, you know what? This is this is cool. They got some good stuff going on, but I don't, I don't see any of them really reaching this campus. I don't really see anyone passionate about reaching this university. There's about 50,000 people that make up this university, if you count staff, students, postdocs, PhDs, master's students, people on their fourth PhD, people on their second degree, people on their third degree, people that haven't managed to get out of engineering yet because they're still in co-op for year six, seven, eight, or nine. Uh, I'm not even kidding. Right, there's a lot of people on this campus and yet there was no church dedicated to serving them. I'm going, well, this is, this is crazy. How can we have a community of tens of thousands of people and no church? But to put it in perspective, I was not an old man. I'm still not an old man. So, like a, like a good guy, like a foolish teenager, I prayed probably one of the most ridiculous prayers I've ever prayed. I said, God, here's the deal. Either you bring me a church in the next two weeks, or I'm just going to start one right here in McKay Hall. You got two weeks, God. I'm giving you a deadline. God loves deadlines. And you know, sometimes I, th th that prayer is theologically bogus for all manner of reasons. But you see, here's the thing. God chooses to work with us. He chooses to work with us even though we're not infinite like he is. He chooses to work with us even though we're small and even perhaps feeling insignificant at times. He says, you know what? I'm going to work with you. I'm going to journey with you. So what did God do? I think it was three days later, I got a phone call from a guy named Dave Slater. He said, hey, I got your email. I'm planting a church at McMaster in the bar. Do you want in? I was like, God, that's hilarious. <laughs> Evidently, he didn't feel that I was quite ready to lead a church at that time. And in hindsight, I definitely was not. I know what we planted Live Church here in this bar nine years ago. We had no clue what we were doing. We had no idea what we were doing, but we... All we wanted to do is serve and honor our God and work with him. I don't know how many of you have ever prayed a prayer like that, where you've said, God, I actually just want to work with you. I just want to journey with you. I just want to work with you. I'm, I'm available. I don't know for sure, but I, I wonder if Adam was like, I'm lonely. But God, I'm available to work with you. Right? So God assigns work for him to do. My challenge to you is, will you make yourself available to God? at this point in your life. You don't need to have all the answers. You don't need to know what you're doing. You can just sometimes, when you pray those foolish prayers, God honors them. 
to the point here is, can the magnitude of the fact that God wants to partner with you and give your life meaning just settle on your heart for a minute? Can the magnitude of how crazy enormous that is that a creator God, an infinite and omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing God would actually want to use you? He actually wants to use you. First Corinthians chapter 3, it says this. Paul's talking about building the church. He's talking about this disagreement they're having between a guy named Apollos and a guy named Paul, and it says this. After all, who is Apollos and who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work God gave us. I planted the seeds in your hearts and Apollos watered, but it was God who made it grow. It is not important who does the watering or who does the... Who does the planting or who does the watering? What is important is that God makes the seeds grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work, for we are both God's workers. Can the imagery here, I, I, Paul was a pretty intelligent man. He was incredibly well read. He's using the imagery of planting and watering to say, check out the created purpose you had in Genesis. Before we screwed it up, we were designed to work with God to advance something according to God's plans, God's purposes, to work with him. He's saying, remember that? We have that back. We have that job today. It has not changed. God is still inviting us to work with him. See, what I'm saying tonight is, whatever you're applying yourself to, whatever adventure you dreamed up or thought up of last week, it's not actually about you. Whatever you're applying yourself to, whatever journey you're on, it's not about you. It's not about you. This is why I left church. We drive home again and again and again. Get involved. Sign up on Engage. Get involved and serve something bigger than you. The first thing tonight is you were created for a relationship. The second thing tonight is that you were created to serve. And these might seem like opposite ideas. You've got to bear with me. I'm going to pull these, these two back together in just a minute. But these are two sides of the same coin, you will see. You were created for relationships, and you were created to serve. You know, if you come tonight and you're like, hey, they got some nice music, or maybe you don't like our music... They got some nice preaching, or maybe you don't like their preaching, my preaching, whatever. They got nice food. Everybody loves the hot dogs. I know nobody's got anything against hot dogs. We developed a very robust theology of the hot dog in August. I'm telling you, you got to go watch those sermons online. You will develop a real appreciation for hot dogs. You know, ultimately, I don't really care what, what people think from a critical standpoint. What I care about is that as a church, we are providing opportunities for people to serve their creator God. All I ultimately want to see is each person in this room walking in their purpose in partnership with God and with the people he has put around in this world to carry that to church. That's what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians. He's saying, you were created to co-work. You were created to water or plant or to do something. You were not created to do nothing. So would you please do something? Would you please plant? Would you please water? Would you please name the animals? Would you please do something to serve your creator, to serve your God? What it says, if you're like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what that is. something. Just get, throw yourself out there. You're not going to learn by sitting and listening. I can guarantee you're not going to build community by sitting and listening. You'll build community when you serve. If you come up and talk to any member of any team that serves at Lift Church, and I'm not just talking about serving on Sundays, I'm talking about serving your creator, diving into the world around you. If you talk to any leader at Lift Church and say, hey, when did you really start to build relationships at Lift? I can guarantee you 100% of them would say, when I started to serve. That's when it goes to the next level. Because it moves the vision from what I can get to what I can do for my creator. It moves the focus of your life from yourself to somebody else, from yourself to your creator. He 
You see, here's the thing. Service and help and journeying with and saying, God, I want to bring you the glory is not just about the project at hand. It's not just about what you can do. We're not interested in building a slave ship here at Lift Church. Contrary to maybe... That's another story for another day. Check it out in verse 20 of chapter 2. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. So in other words, he was applying himself. He was working. He was serving. He was doing something. He was partnering with God. But still, there was no helper just right for him. Still, there was no helper just right for him. See, Adam's call to work with and partner with and journey with God was glorious, but it was incomplete. Your call to apply yourself to something bigger than yourself, to give your life to something bigger than you, is glorious, but it's also incomplete. The reason it's incomplete is that you need relationship. See, a project and a vision and an ambition and even a glorious desire to serve God is incomplete if you do it outside of the context of relationship. See, there was no helper just right for him. It's saying there was no relational context from which he was serving. God created us for relationship. See, our humanity is most satisfied I believe, when we join together with others to serve the glory of God. Our humanity is most satisfied when we join with others to magnify and to glorify God. See, God is more glorified when we come together in community, when we journey together in community with each other in the context of relationship than when you just sit at home and watch YouTube videos of your favorite sermon. See, because you were created for relationship. You were created to journey in relationship. I can remember when I was a little boy. I had just immigrated to Canada. I think it was the late 90s. It was January. I think we moved here in December, and it was January. So one of those cold minus 20 nights. I'm from South Africa. I've never seen snow. I don't know how to dress myself. Um, and I remember, you know, you see kids, you know, good hardened Canadian kids, and they run around with their, like, shorts on in January. I was like, oh, I can do that. Nah. It was, it was a bad scene. Anyway, my mom was a little crazy. At that time, South Africa was one of the most dangerous countries in the world. It was pretty violent. Uh, it was, I think it had the highest crime rate in the world. So my mom was a little ambitious. She's like, we're in Canada now. It's the safest, most glorious country in the world. So I'm just going to send my eight-year-old and my nine-year-old, and I think she even sent my sister, who was like six, downtown Toronto to go serve at the food bank. <laughs> All the other mothers. I'm, I, I'm sure there were calls made to the Children's Aid Society. <laughs> So she, she, she connects us with one of the guys at the church, and off we go. She sends us downtown. It's minus 20. I've got like little teeny, wind, teeny thin socks on. I'm not dressed appropriately. Quite certain I'm going to freeze to death. And off we went to go serve at the soup kitchen, or whatever it was. And I remember that was my first encounter with alcoholism. That was my first encounter with somebody who was definitely coming off of a very, very bad high. It was crazy, and we, we served, and we applied ourselves, and it was, it was robust, and it was magnificent. But you know what was the most significant thing? The person who took me. I journeyed with him, and he became a dear friend and a mentor. And for about the next five or six years, he walked with me. And that relationship laid some of the seeds, laid some of the foundation that would become and would ultimately yield fruit in my life as I started to mentor and pour into others. See, it wasn't just that we were serving, it's that we were serving in the context of relationship. And those relationships blossomed as we began to serve. I began to trust this guy that took me downtown and protected me as a little boy serving at the soup kitchen. I began to trust him and say, you know what, actually, wow, this is amazing. When I, when I work with you, I can trust you. And I began to allow him to mention me. You see, when we serve in the context of community, something magnificent happens. Both our service is magnified and our relationships are magnified. That's what it's talking about here. It's saying Adam was doing something, 
but it wasn't complete because it was outside of the context of relationship. So this is why it, when finally the woman is created, at last the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called the woman because she was taken from the man. See, a fundamental desire in us is satisfied when we are helped and when we help. See, it's not just about being helpers and it's not just about being helped. It's about those two coming together. Adam was working with and serving God. He was helping. He was saying, I'm going to contribute. And it was incomplete because he was not doing it in relationship. He needed just to have someone come alongside him and say, I'm going to journey with you. I'm going to partner with you. I'm going to serve alongside you. The imagery is pretty profound here. Verse 25. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I alluded to this earlier. They shall become one flesh. Now normally this, this context is quoted in the context of marriage. It's quoted in the context of, okay, this is what happens when you get married. You got one, you got two, they become, they become one, one flesh. And it's awesome and it's glorious. But I think there's something actually, a secondary commentary happening here. It's saying Adam was working and he needed a helper. And the helper comes along. And what were two become ones. In other words, the vehicle, the mechanism by which two become one is through serving each other. If we want relationships to flourish, if you're sitting there going, man, my relationships are broken, my relationships are fragmented, my relationships are frustrated, I believe that we were created to serve and honor each other in the context of those relationships. And what, were, what would be two become one. What was fractured would become unified. See, when we serve together, when we dedicate our lives to something bigger than ourselves, What were two become one? I've had to learn this over the last several years being married. Learning that, you know what? My wife is most honored when I serve her. Our relationship is most fractured when I become the center of it. When I think that it's about me. When I want it to be what I can get or what I can accomplish or what vision I can see fulfilled. But when we strive together, when I serve my wife, when I put her needs ahead of mine, man, the relationship begins to flourish. See, we were created to help and to serve each other. But Adam was lonely. He was frustrated. He was applying himself, but it was incomplete. And in comes the woman. And she completes it by serving alongside him, by honoring him, by journeying with him. You see, something happens. In most of our lives, we don't really want to serve. We don't really want to put ourselves out there to the benefit of somebody else, unless something is going to benefit us. See, instead of serving, what happens is we want to rule. Instead of being a servant, we want to be a king. And we want to be the kind of king that dictates. This is what happens. This is why in Genesis chapter 3, when we all screwed up, when sin enters the world, what happens to the relationship between man and woman? Verse 16. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. See, we were created to rule, yes, but we were not created to rule over each other. But what happens is our desires and our longings, the center of our life becomes ourselves. What we can gain, what we can benefit, what we can accomplish, how much we can do, how popular we can be, how significant we can be, how important we can be. Those become the motivators. Those become the measures of our lives. So we start to want to rule over others. We start to want popularity so that we can feel fulfilled. 
But our fulfillment is not found in those things. It's not found in ruling. It's not found in dictating. It's not found in control. It's found in service. See, rather than the two becoming one, what happens here it becomes fractured. It becomes a relationship of control, a relationship of rule. Because the center of the relationship moves from God and how we can serve him to ourselves and how we can serve ourselves. The word helper, when it talks about there was no helper for him, I don't always do language studies, but I think this one is, is pretty mind-blowing. The word helper there, we, we translate, we say, well, helper, the, the woman was meant to help the man. You know, ruling and hierarchy. But the word there, in every other use in the Old Testament, refers to God helping humanity. God coming to the aid of the Israelites. God coming to the aid of David in the Psalms. God coming and saving and being a help. But God is not subordinate to us. God is not subject to us. See, the idea here is not about who rules and who establishes the hierarchy. The idea behind help is about mutual service and saying, I'm going to honor you by serving you. You, wherever you are, were created to serve those around you. You were created to be one who gives honor and opportunity to those that are around you. Help and service is not about hierarchy. This is why the two can become one. The two can become one because it's no longer about who rules the other. It's no longer about what you can do to rule over and control others, but how you can serve others. But you see, in the midst of our world where we each want to be king, where we each want to rule, where we each want to establish something, another king came into the world. See, Jesus enters the world as a king. He enters the world as a baby, but he enters the world to establish his kingship. He enters the world to say, God is coming to establish his kingdom. The kingdom of God is near. It announces over and over and over and over again in the book of Matthew. The kingdom is here, but Jesus came to establish a different kind of kingdom. John 5, 19, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. So in other words, the kind of kingship that Jesus came to establish was one of humility. Jesus didn't come to say, I'm the king and this is what I declareth. He came to say, no, actually, this is what my father says. And I journey with my father. I work with my father. I serve my father. I honor my father. Jesus could have done whatever he wanted. Jesus was God. But he chose to honor his father. See, this is the kind of kingship that Jesus came to establish. The kind of kingship where, we, where the king serves. The kind of kingship and the kind of kingdom where you are not first. The kind of kingship where the Father is magnified and glorified. See, when our relationships are fragmented and frustrated and broken and we're feeling lonely, or when our purpose is fragmented and broken and we don't know where we're going and we feel directionless, I believe the intention for the, God, the way God created us was first to serve in the context of relationship. We were created to serve in the context of relationship. And Jesus establishes this. John 17, his final prayer, he's saying this, I pray that they may be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Jesus established the kind of kingdom where he served, but he served out of relationship with his Father. And he calls us to serve out of relationship with each other and relationship with our God. So I have a very simple question for you tonight. 
before we get to my question, I have a very simple statement that this is what the church is for. This is what we are here at Lift Church to do. We are here to serve and love each other and our Creator. So my question for you is, how are you going to serve those around you? And how are you going to serve your Creator this year? What practical thing are you going to do? How are you going to actually change the way you live so that instead of you being the center of what you can do, what you can accomplish, so you can serve others? See, this isn't about picking up a project and saying, okay, cool, I'm going to join the team, I'm going to do this and that or that. This is about the way you perceive yourself. About reorienting your life from being around you to being around the service of others. From being around you to being around the glory of God. So we join the party tonight. The party where we get to everyone's just serving and loving and pouring into each other. Will you live for something greater than yourself? Let's bow our heads and pray. Jesus, it can't be about us. This church can't be about me. It can't be about doing more fancier. God, it's got to be about you. Our lives only find meaning when we serve you, love you, serve others, love others. Jesus, help me to move the eyes from myself, my eyes from myself to you, my eyes from myself to the person next to me. Father, I pray that each person in this room would develop a vision for serving those that they journey with, those that are next to them, those that they live in church community with. If that's you tonight, if you're saying, yeah, I want to... I want to learn to take my eyes off of myself so that I can serve others. I want to find practical ways of, of honoring and cherishing those I walk in relationship with. If that's you tonight, why don't you just throw up your hand and say, yeah, that's me. Yeah, you can just throw it down once it's up. Awesome. God, help us to love like you loved. God, that we would walk in unity, that we would be one just as you and your Father are one, that you would be in us. So ultimately that the world may believe that you are good, that you are worthy, that you are great. Amen. Well, thanks for hanging out with us, church. It's been a great night. A little bit bumpy, but we've had a good evening. We'll be back here next week at 7 p.m. It's going to be awesome so we can wrap up our series. Otherwise, we'll see you at something this week. Maybe getting connected with a simple church. If you haven't said hello, come on and say hello. We're excited to meet you. Go grab some dinner and uh, stay a while. Listen.